Hi, and welcome to today's broadcast. Before we begin, there are a few pieces of information to go over. In order to receive CPE credit for this program, you'll need to document your participation. You will see letter codes appear in the form of a graphic on your screen several times throughout the course, and you will need to capture every code in order to be issued credit. As each letter code appears, write it down, then enter it in the appropriate code submission box and click Submit. Remember to click Submit one final time at the conclusion of the program as well. You will then be issued a certificate documenting your attendance and credits earned. If you have a question at any point during the broadcast, you may submit it in the questions box. We will try to answer your question as soon as possible. Should you run into any technical difficulties, submit your codes, then try refreshing the page. If your problems persist, please call us at 973-226-4494. This broadcast is being recorded and will be available on our website shortly after its conclusion. Enjoy! We said throughout this uh, uh, convention, we could not do what we're doing here uh, over the last couple of days without uh, the tremendous support from our partners and uh, firms uh, out there uh, to support this endeavor. So, are you guys ready for some interesting conversation? All right. Okay, a couple housekeeping items uh, that I may want to get. If you want to ask a question, oh. you'll notice that we don't have mics up around because we don't want people making a statement. Those are uh, things. So you can use the convention app to ask a question and it will be fed to me up here. Uh, uh, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, I think that helps uh, the, the, the program go along well. So I'm going to take my seat over here and uh, get started and with the introductions. I think. Am I live here? Okay, You're thank you. On. Okay. I'm on. Everybody's on. Okay. <laughs> so, as I said, we have a, an interesting panel of experts, and I'll, I'll do my best to uh, appropriately introduce everybody since they're sitting in different seats from uh, different from my time. So, to my immediate left, I'm Tom Byrne. <laughs> we, you're, you're Tom Byrne today. Uh, we have Tom Byrne, who is the, uh, and I think I got this right, the former. New Jersey State Investment Council Chair, uh, which, when, where he oversaw the investment of New Jersey's public pension fund assets. He is also a managing director and head of equity portfolio of Burn Asset Management. Did I get that right, Tom? Pretty and much right. I got two weeks left in the job. Two, <laughs> two weeks so left. I'll be the uh, chairman of the investment council to the end of the fiscal year. Okay, very good. And also, Tom is the son of uh, Brendan Byrne. Um, all of you know Brendan uh, uh, passed away recently, and uh, we certainly miss him and, and miss all that he brought to, to New Jersey. Thank you. And then uh, next to Tom is a, is a good friend and one of our NJCPA members, Jack Cittarelli. Jack is the former state assemblyman for the 16th Legislative District. This is the district that I live in. And he has he served from 2011 to 2018, where he sat on the Financial Institutions and Insurance Committee and the Regulated Professions Committee, which is the committee that uh, has oversight over the CPA profession, as well as other licensed professions. And more importantly, he was a candidate for governor in the 2017 Republican gubernatorial primary, in which he sacrificed by giving up his assembly seat to run for that position. 
Um, Jack is also a businessman and um, has done extremely well, I think, in with the various business. Good morning, and, everybody. <laughs> good morning. And next to, uh, to Jack, we have Senator Steve Oroho, who is currently is the senator from up in Sussex County, uh, not Sussex County, excuse me, Sparta area, right? Yes, Sussex, Sussex, Warren, and Morris. Okay, very good. Uh, and also, uh, Senator Oroho is also a member of the NJCPA um, and has been a real supporter of the society during his, uh, his term in the legislature. And is somebody that is well respected on both sides of the aisle uh, for his contribution in bringing the facts to the table when we're talking about public policy. And then last but not least is Tom Bergeron. And Tom, I hope I got your last name correct. Absolutely. Okay. He's editor in chief content officer of ROI New Jersey. And that's a digital and, and print outlet covering business and politics in New Jersey. ROI launched in uh, the fall of 2017. He's a 25 year veteran of journalism, having previously worked at NJB, NJBiz, Yahoo, and the Star Ledger. Ladies and gentlemen, why don't you take an opportunity to welcome our panelists this morning. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, it's no secret, it's uh, June 15th, and we're uh, 15 days away from hopefully getting a state budget passed. We are? <laughs> we are? Well, since you say that, Senator Oro, I will start with you with the question of, there's been a lot of talk about the possibility of a state shutdown. Can you give us your view of whether that uh, is a possibility? And, and if it is, I understand that there's a little mechanism in there, potentially, that will allow us to get through the 4th of July holiday if there is a set down. So, um, well, uh, quite frankly, I know we've been called in for a budget meeting on Monday. I said on the Senate Budget and Appropriations Committee, and we've been called in for a scheduled meeting on Monday, uh, and then as well on Tuesday to deal with uh, supposedly the, the, the bills associated with the budget. And then there's potential for a uh, vote uh, next Thursday is what I, I, I understand. Um, there's nothing yet to vote on. So it's going to be, it's, it's interesting that obviously the uh, majority party and the uh, governor's office are, are I think, hopefully uh, negotiating. I think they have been uh, at odds, uh, whether, whether it be the, the, the number of revenue raisers that are in the current budget. Uh, concern about uh, spending on new programs when uh, uh, you know a number of people think that we should uh, be keeping the fiscal discipline. I think a number of people are concerned about uh, the number of down quote unquote down payments that are in uh, that are in uh, in the budget. So um, listen, we always get to you know get get to the end get get to the goal line or actually I wouldn't call it the goal line. That's a good thing when you score a touchdown. I wouldn't necessarily qualify this budget as being a, 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 a good thing. Um, there are good things in it, but it's not something that uh, I've, obviously I would have uh, uh, proposed. Uh, it would have been you know, probably you know, different. But um, we have the date of June 30th to have to get done. Uh, we do have uh, some bills in there that would keep the uh, state parks open if we're not done. Uh, they actually have not been voted on yet, though. I mean, they're at a committee. But they haven't been voted on. So there's a number of pressure points that I think each of the parties are trying to keep on each other. Um, and then obviously there's also the pressure of the, uh, of the public wanting to, uh, to get, get things finished. So we have the insider view. Let's, uh, let's go for an outside. Tom, let me uh, uh, move to you. What are you hearing amongst your colleagues uh, about the possibility of a state shutdown? So from what we hear about the state budget and the shutdown, the possibility is, somebody said it great to me the other day, said there, there's two situations here. First of all, it's how do you play the game? How do you play the budget game? And when you have a new governor who's trying to understand how to play the game with the legislator, first you've got to figure out what the rules are. And to this point, if I'll speak for you, um, there doesn't seem to be an understanding from the governor to the legislature on how the game is even played. Uh, so that's a huge stumbling block. Usually at this point in the negotiations, it's, okay, who's going to win the game? Who's going to battle the game? How are we going to do the plays? What are we going to do? How are we going to negotiate? So the first thing is the governor's office needs to understand that it's not just simply hey, we've decided this is what we're going to do and, and everybody's going to go for it. 
So there's the playing of the game. And then when you get to the game, I talked to an assembly insider, not an assemblyman, but someone who works in there. And they said, look, we had, a, we had a meeting with the governor and said, here's a way we can do all of the things you want to do without raising taxes. And his response was that the governor wasn't really interested in that. He was more interested and wants to make sure that we're going to raise taxes. He sees more money. So there was a situation where someone's trying to engage in the game and the governor was a little absent. So again, this always comes down to the last minute. You guys know how that works. But it seems, and with the new governor, it's always different. But from what we're hearing from the people um, in the legislature is there is a, a lack of understanding of how to play the game right now, and then, then you have to start playing it. And that's the fun part that keeps these guys up until midnight and two in the morning in the final days. Well, my tablet is very active. We've got a number of questions that have already come in. But I want to give uh, uh, Jack and Tom an opportunity to weigh in on your thoughts of whether there will be a shutdown. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll take a little bit of a different view of this. I, I agree with everything that's been said. We don't have anything to negotiate yet. Um, we're not playing the game well yet. Um, but um, I've seen, for as long as I've been active in, in state issues, um, these, the same sorts of headlines every year. That nobody can agree, um, shutdown looming, budget crisis looming. And every year it gets magically solved. And, and so, I refer to us sometimes as the boy who cried wolf state, uh, um, that we hear this so often that we become a little bit inured to it. And um, I think it's dangerous because I think one way or another, you guys are going to solve a one billion or billion and a half dollar problem or this, whatever you want to call it. Um, it won't be pretty, but it'll get solved. What gets ignored in all this not totally ignored, but not really dealt with, is what I call the structural uh, problems in government. Um, so in addition to being chairman of the investment council that oversees all the pension money, I also served on a 10-member commission appointed by Governor Christie a couple years ago to try to figure out how to deal with the, the pension crisis. And those numbers, in the context of a state budget that is 35 billion, 37 billion, depending, um, we have a, an unfunded liability in the state pension system of anywhere between 50 and $150 billion, depending on what you believe about investment return assumptions and how much the state can afford to put in over time. And so my point is that I get a call from a reporter yesterday, and he says, um, you know, don't we have to raise taxes um, if the money's going to run out? And I said, no, because every year um, we say just a little bit more in taxes, and it accumulates over time. Um, you know, state spending has increased over the last 20 years about a percent and a half uh, faster than the CPI, and you all understand compound interest. So at some point, we've got to deal with the structural stuff. You can solve in a couple of days at crunch time a billion dollar or two billion dollar problem. You cannot wait till the last minute to solve a 50 or 150 billion dollar problem. And that doesn't even include the healthcare liabilities, that's just pension, it doesn't include anything else. And so uh, I, I'm gonna throw one more metaphor at you and then stop for the moment. I say to some people in the legislature, and I'm a former chairman of the state Democratic Party, I got friends on both sides, I talk to Democrats, and one of the things I say is that, um, when I was a little kid, I'm homesick from school one day, I read a thing in the Reader's Digest and it says, if you're in a rowboat in the middle of the Niagara River and you're a quarter mile up, you can row as hard as you want and it's too late, you're going over. We don't know where New Jersey is uh, in, in that picture. Are we three eighths of a mile up? Is it too late? But we better start rowing really hard, really fast, because otherwise um, we really could have um, a financial and budget and even economic crash in the state. I'll stop there at least for now. Okay, and I'm gonna come back to you because sure. uh, obviously the pension issue, but Jack, your view on, on, on where things stand as we get, try to get to what some may say is a fairy tale ending or well, with regard to the budget, I mean, I'm no longer on the inside. My term ended January 9th of, um, of this year, which meant that Steve Orojo is now the only CPA in the entire state legislature. So we went from a ratio of 60 to 1 to 120 to 1. Steve, you have my sympathy. <laughs> um, but um, you know, there's an old saying, if it weren't for the last second, nothing would ever get done. And everything that you see and hear, 
I think, up until this point, is jockeying for position. It's a tactic. It's seeing what's sticking with the public. Um, unfortunately, the public doesn't pay as close attention as we wish it did. Those of us that um, are into the whole public policy and what care deeply about the state. Um, so, listen, I, I think there's a great deal of pressure felt by the fact that the Democratic Party controls overwhelmingly the Assembly, the Senate, the Senate, and obviously the executorial branch with the governorship. So for them not to have a budget ready by July 1st and for there to be a shutdown, that did happen under Corzine when the Democratic Party controlled all three. It happened last year for the first time in Christie's last year over the tax reform negotiation, right, with Vinnie Prieto. So I think it's 50-50. Um, 50 percent that there is no shutdown because they feel enormous pressure. 50 percent of a chance there will be a shutdown because there's some strong personality and philosophical clashes taking place. And I think the Democratic legislature is more acutely aware of the Florio $2.8 billion increase and what impact that had on incumbents than Phil Murphy. Um, Phil Murphy uh, you know, I'll go back to the election for a second. I really don't think people of this state voted for Phil Murphy's agenda. I think it was an anti-Christie vote. People tend to vote against something than for something. He's mistaken. He's kidding himself if he thinks that people voted for his progressive agenda. I need to tell you, I went around this state as a gubernatorial candidate in the primary, and two things I never heard about were a free universal pre-K statewide and free community college. I never heard those two things. And those are hundreds of millions of dollars in tax increases to afford those two things. There's a time and a place for a progressive agenda. This ain't it in New Jersey for all the reasons these three gentlemen said. Yeah, you know, the only thing I would add is that this isn't just inside baseball. Um, uh, it has implications for the state's economy, which over the last 20 years has grown about a third as fast as the nation's GDP. Um, we used to be the center of innovation, um, you know, Edison, Bell Labs, all that stuff. It's not here. There are a lot of variables. But state policy is one of them. The fact that we have a tax code that discourages venture investing in this state. McKinsey has pointed out that it has tied that to the, fact, to the fact that we don't have as much venture investing and, then, and therefore job creation and growth of smaller and, and mid-sized companies in this state as in many other places. So uh, I go on and on. But my point is that this is not inside baseball. This affects uh, all of us and it affects the state economy in a lot of ways. Tom, you and, wanted and Let me jump in on one thing that, that we hear all the time. The, the hardest obstacle for Phil Murphy or the biggest disadvantage that he has is that the Democrats do control everything. So here you have a neophyte coming in trying to understand the situation and there's nobody to throw under the bus. It would be really easy to say, hey, Steve, I, I'd like to do what you want, but I got to do what Jack wants in order to get this budget passed. Right. Now we're all on the same team, so everybody wants to win. Who's going to lose? Who's not going to get what may have been promised to them? There's no opponent to say, hey, we have to make a deal. We have to negotiate. We have to give a little on this to get that and, and throw the other side under the bus. I mean, Chris Christie, for what he did, immediately made friends with Steve Sweeney, and they both battled a little bit, but they could go back to the respective parties and say, we're going to get A and B, but we got to give on C. Right now, when you control everything, and you can take this to the, to the Corzine years, you can take it to Trump right now, you can take it to Obama in his first two years. When you control everything, it's really hard to negotiate within your own party, and that's the other issue. When they start playing the game that they're going to have to face. Senator, you want... You yeah, just uh, real quick, because a couple of points were brought up with respect to... I mean, I can see it going two, two ways. One is, uh, let's say, legislators as well as administration, when you're coming down there, June 30th is coming past. Uh, you know, each day that you go down there, you know, you get more and more agitated. Uh, but the issue then, be, you know, is the strong personalities you have. Do those strong personalities, you know, say, okay, let's get this done? Or they go a little bit, you know, for, you know further apart. So I do think that um, as, you know, I do think we'll, we'll probably you know, get something done by, by, uh, by June 30th. But I think the most important thing, and it's not something that, you know, most, you know, the Republicans will, will, will like, uh, I don't think they expect any any Republican votes, and that's one of the reasons why there's such you know such a class within the you know the uh, Democrat Party right now. But but Tom hits the, hits to keep uh, the yearly budgets get a lot easier if we dealt with the long range long range problems. No doubt about it. Yeah. Ralph, one last comment on the okay. budget is that what I found most disappointing about Governor Murphy's 
budget proposal is it did not address the three crises facing this state, which are the property tax crisis, the school funding crisis, and the pension crisis. It is status quo on those three things. And for all the reasons Tom talked about, this is nothing more than another Band-Aid. Yeah, okay. It, and it, it, not even status quo, because, because one of the issues is, and you're right, Dave, we didn't deal with the structural issue, but it's also a down payment. I mean, the, the, the issue was discussed in the, in the governor's uh, budget message was, this is a down payment, which means there's more to come. And, one of the, and it wasn't just the Republican Party, but it was the Democrat Party. I mean, Senator Paul Sarlo, who I have done a number of uh, bills with o over the years, uh, budget uh, chairman was asking the treasurer very specific question, how long does this go on for? What is the projection of what it's going to look like uh, you know, a year, a two, a three, or four years you know, down the road? So speaking of, of projections... Um um, Ralph, you will get to talk at one point. <laughs> okay. I, 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 hey, I'm enjoying the conversation. Oh, no. I'm just <laughs> so in, in speaker. Sp understand one thing that most of you think understand is that discretionary spending in the state budget is actually a relatively small yeah, slice of it. There's so many fixed costs, things you have to do, um, mandates, <laughs> whatever. Um, so in 2014, the pensions and um, health care consumed 10.7 percent of the state budget. Uh, projections are that by 2023, without structural reform, that number will jump from 10.7% to 26%. That probably wipes out discretionary spending or uh, causes massive tax increases. That's how big the problem is. Oh, yeah. So the big elephant in the room is, this, is the pension plan. Tom, why, you, you, you headed up the Burn Healy Commission, uh, which I think had some very good recommendations. Me too. Where does that stand? Are we, and I know we were moving down the road, and then when the uh, total amount of the pension wasn't funded one year, everybody walked away from the table. Is that work that the commission did still appropriate, and, and, and what needs to be done, in your mind, to get us off the side? Well, um, I'll say two things. I'll try to summarize it quickly rather than get two in the weeds on the commission report right now. Happy to go back over it. But... Um, we issue a report, I guess it was in early uh, 2015, and it called uh, for um, changes that the unions refer to as givebacks, and rightly so. Um, and they made a political calculation that uh, we think we're gonna elect a Democratic governor in two years, and so um, we just choose not to deal with this. We think we can, we can get our way in two years. So the substance of the recommendations in very simple terms was we needed to come up with uh, an additional two and a half billion at the time. That number's grown just like because of compound interest. Um, we needed to come up with about two and a half billion of additional money to put into the pension system each year. We said that um, if we put public employees on uh, Obamacare gold plans or its actuarial equivalent, in other words, an 80, a plan with an 80% actuarial value rather than the current 96% actuarial value, which is unheard of um, you know, pretty much anywhere else in the world, certainly in the private sector, we could squeeze savings just at the state level, uh, and we're not even talking about municipal employees, of about a billion four a year. Um, and we said that we would support a constitutional requirement that those savings would have to be recycled uh, into additional contributions into the pension system. And so what we're saying to the unions uh, essentially is take money from the left pocket to the right pocket, and yes, your health care is going to cost a little bit more, but no more than what President Obama, not Chris Christie, what President Obama says is fair. Um, and um, you keep it all, and that helps to secure your pension system. We also talked about um, some changes to the pension plan itself. The point of departure was um, everything we've promised you to date, you get. Whether it was a smart or stupid promise, you get it. But going forward, the rules have to change a little bit. In the private sector, often what happens is they say, um, defined benefit plan over, good luck, you're in a defined contribution plan. Right. We said we didn't think that was fair. There's all kinds of research that um, people don't know how to manage their money in 401ks, et cetera. Um, so we said, let's go to a hybrid plan. And the two key changes are that instead of final average salary, it'll be a straight line um, 
uh, accumulation so that the, the baseline for setting the pension will be lower, number one. And number two, instead of taxpayers underwriting a 7.65% guaranteed annual return, that number has to reflect more market rates. We thought that could save at least another billion dollars a year. Then there were some more technical details, which I won't bore you with right now. We thought that if we did those things, um, that we could come up with enough savings to fully fund the pension each year. Um, and that hasn't happened, obviously. And so by 2023, uh, the actuaries tell us that we'll have to put $11 billion a year into the pension system. 6.6 .6 billion of that will have to come from the state if we're gonna meet things. And if we don't and the pension system crashes, um, which could happen according to some actuaries in as little as a dozen years. The judges fund, there are a bunch of different funds. The judges will go first in three or four years. And as I've kidded around, it'll be interesting to see how the judges rule on that. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we've got a problem and, and the clock is really ticking. Okay. Um, the assembly speaker and Senate president have said absolutely, I think, uh, and this is on the record, that there will be no increase in the sales tax and the millionaire's tax is off the table. But if you listen to political insiders and if you listen to our, our, our governor, those are two things that he wants to uh, pursue, I believe, mm -hmm. in that regard. If you had to choose between the two, <laughs> which one would you take? I know we did a survey with our members. One, Jack. But <laughs> no. <laughs> well, listen, <laughs> this, this, this gentleman on my left did a magnificent job last year of negotiating the only deal that could possibly come out of the Christie, Sweeney, Prieto, whatever it is you want to call it, which funded our transportation trust fund, which improves our roads and bridges, which is critical to our economy. Um, he, he got the best deal he could, given the circumstances. In my opinion, and it's no disrespect for a man I love, uh, that doesn't mean it was the best deal, in, in my opinion, because that deal was magnificent and got rid of the estate tax. Mm -hmm. It made more retirement income, less retirement income, taxable. So it increased the exclusions, and it increased the earned income tax credit for the working poor who pay the greater tax uh, on, on gasoline. Um, the one other thing that it did is it decreased the sales tax ultimately three-eighths of a penny, right. which saves all of us over the course of a year somewhere between $100 and $125. That's not a lot, but aggregately speaking, that's about $600 million. Mm -hmm. I felt the sales tax shouldn't have been reduced and that it should have been dedicated toward the pension fund rather than that reduction dedicated. But he got the only deal he could that was critical uh, to, to the economy. And, and I applaud Steve for what he accomplished. So uh, listen, I, I've said this when I was running for governor. Um, if there was gonna be a single tax increase under my governorship, it was gonna be the sales tax going back to 7%. I said that all along. And I would take every dime of that, every dime, every penny, and dedicate it toward the public pension deficit, because I'll tell you what, that increase that Tom is talking about over the next 10 years, where it goes from 10% to 25% of our budget, is causing a crowding out effect of epic proportions. And I doubt very much whether or not you're gonna see the program cuts to pay for that increase, which means you're gonna be taxed even more. Mm. Yeah, so again, and crowding, crowding out, by the way, the biggest discretionary item in the state budget is aid to suburban schools. New Jersey's one of, the, one of our strongest selling points, great place to raise your kids, great public schools. That's threatened. Yeah. I mean, the one of the biggest problem, and, and, and Jack, thank you with respect to like the whole transportation, where it was our number one issue is property taxes. We all know that, right? And the issue of the transportation trust fund, I mean, the state was taking the money that should have been to the counties and municipalities, so therefore, Tax, uh, property taxes were going up, and unfortunately, I even heard from people in, in our party that said, Steve, don't let people know because they don't realize it. And that's, that's to me, that, that was um, uh, completely wrong. Um, so property taxes were going up every, every year as, uh, as a result. The issue uh, on the premise of which to pick, uh, Ralph, I don't think we need either one. Because if we dealt with, you, you, you look at the state level, uh, the $1.4 billion of just going from platinum to gold, right? Yeah. You talk at the state level, and let's so and and it's it's got to be somewhere 1.5 to 2 billion at the local level, county, municipality, 2.5 probably. 2.5. Right, right. 
Uh, and that's all property taxes, you know, right, right, right there. No other variables. You cut property taxes 8%. Right. Go ahead. Sorry. So, so right there. And most employees, because now they're paying a higher percentage of the premium, will actually save money. Uh, there was an example recently, recently where um, we have actually two state health benefit plans. One is the state health benefit plan, and one is the school employee health benefit plan. The co county colleges were automatically, legislatively, put into the school employee uh, benefit plan. Now, um, school employee uh, plan. Unfortunately, the uh, members of that plan, um, or the um, leaders of that plan, would not negotiate this year. Right. So the state health benefit plan didn't have an increase, and the school employees plan uh, had a 13% increase. The county colleges wanted to switch plans. And wouldn't you believe uh, some of the more um, I guess, I guess you could say powerful special interest groups started calling legislators and said, uh, we, you know, don't vote for that. It was a, actually a sweeney Oroho bill in, 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 in the Senate. Don't vote for that bill uh, because we didn't negotiate that bill. Well, when the school employee health benefit plan wasn't ne never negotiated to begin with. It was just legislatively done. That's one example. You know how much the county colleges would save mm. one year? $24 million. Yeah just with a simple little vote. Yep. Um, and that's just where we say, so if we don't tackle the nut of the health care and the pensions, everything else is superfluous. So, right. so oh, here's, here's so, the non-Trenton view of this. Okay. Right? Never been in any of these negotiations. No one ever asked me about tax. I'll speak for the, for the common man. Uh, Jack's right on. Nobody voted for Phil Murphy that said, yeah, I, I can't wait to pay all these taxes because I believe in it. It was absolutely a vote against him. But at the same time, as I look out here, <clears throat> Does anyone here want to pay $125 a year extra? Just $125? So people who have an outrageous pension fund and pay nothing for their health benefits can keep them? I mean, I don't. If you're, if you're in the 96% plan, and so we can talk about all the taxes, but when you want to talk about a fairer and a smarter economy, let's start with that. So I need to give more money because somebody negotiated or non-negotiated a pension plan or a health plan years ago that I'm now on the hook for where they get outrageous benefits. I don't get outrageous benefits where I work at. My health, my, I pay more every year. So the idea that you want even a dollar from me to make sure that somebody else gets to have the greatest plan in the world and a full pension, come on. So let's start with that. Yeah, agreed. And here's the... I'm not currently I, running for office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, not, the three of us are very jealous. <laughs> You're not running for office, and the political problem in this state is you're certainly not running in a Democratic primary when you say that stuff. And that is a lot of the political problem in this yeah. state, is you cannot get through a Democratic primary um, if you take stands like this. And the public employee unions are a huge presence in the Democratic primary, and you have to tilt way to the left. And by the way, on an ordinary um, questionnaire, or an ordinary test, if you get a 95, that's an A. If you get a 95 on one of these uh, questionnaires, um, a 95 is an F. You know, by, by the way, uh, to, to, to Tom's point, during the Corzine administration, Phil Murphy chaired a pension reform commission yeah, that came yeah. out with recommendations that were very, very similar to the commission Tom chaired under the Christie administration. But those recommendations have gone away since he had to win a primary and is, right. is now governor and um, saddled up with uh, the public sector unions. So we know, what the prob we know what the problems are. How do we get to the finish line and get a budget that makes sense for New Jersey? One that doesn't, isn't predicated on increasing taxes, Mm -hmm. looks at how do we decrease, co decrease expenses and costs, and that how do we get there? I'll tell you, and, and, and Tom alluded to it, and, and both Tom's you know, alluded to it, is the fact that you know, um, when we did the transportation trust fund, it was told, Steve, you can't do it because you'll use, lose your election, right? How about just telling people the truth? People can handle, they can actually deal with the truth when you tell them, here's the problem we face today. This is the way we got to get out of this problem. Um, the Burn Healy report, I read it cover to cover, it was an excellent report. It, it detailed all, 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 the, all the problems we had to deal with today. We've studied them to death. You go over 25 years, there's been study after study after mm -hmm. study. We know the answers. 
The only thing we need really in Trenton is I, 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 when I'm, uh, I give a lot of credit to Senate President Sweeney. He put together a, um, a bipartisan uh, committee yeah. looking at economic and tax policy and whatnot. And Ralph, I know you and I s sit on that uh, committee. Yeah. But I got in and, and dealing with uh, the one th the first thing I said in one of those meetings is the studies are out there. The thing I wish we could have is everybody takes a courage pill and to be able to do and handle the problems today. And we need a transition period, but handle them today so people can handle the truth. And the Burn Hill report was an excellent report. So maybe if we made recreational marijuana legal, we <laughs> could take a courage pill like that and start doing it. Either that or we pass it and we still have a budget crisis, but at least people wouldn't care as much. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't have anything to do this weekend, we'll make sure that we put the, uh, the pension report that the commission delivered up so that you can have some weekend reading and uh, see all the things that, uh, that Tom and, and our, our panelists have talked about in this. Uh, let's, well, I want to move to some of the questions that have been asked. Uh, so we, uh, and the first one up was, again, if you had to choose which would do more damage to New Jersey's economy? the millionaire's tax or hike in the corporate tax. And I would also ask, put in there a third one, the sales tax, because that's, that's been vetted. Because as, as I'm looking at this, and I, you know, I've been not as deep as, as your senator and, and others, but it appears that there is going to be a push to increase taxes in some way, shape, or form to try to address the budget that's been put on the table, which is a $2.5 billion over the prior year's budget. So. If I had to put in priority order, um, and as I said, I wouldn't want, I don't think it's necessary for any, and that's my major premise is, if I had to put them in priority order, the, our priority is we have to keep capital here in New Jersey. If those states that are attractive to capital grow well, do well. Uh, and New Jersey, unfortunately, used to be attracted to capital, and uh, getting rid of the estate tax, I think, was a, was a major uh, uh, reason or a good thing for it. Um, I would, the millionaire's tax, I would say, that, that's the most mobile. I'd say no. Uh, then I would go to the corporate business tax. Uh, I would, I would, you know, that would be the second one not to. And the last would be the, the, the sales tax. I mean, the issue of I, I'd, I'd rather prefer to have a user. My thing, my thing is I'd rather prefer to have a user fee than a general tax. Uh, but let me say once again, I, I don't think it's necessary to have either one. However, that would be my priority order. But if you don't do that, then how does the $37.5 billion budget it implemented, or are there going to be line item vetoes on on certain uh, um, programs and things? That's a very like good point. The issue. Go ahead, Jay. Well, I was going to say uh, this is not a time and a place for universal pre free pre K throughout right. the state. This is not a time and a place for free community college, which is very problematic from a policy implementation standpoint. Um, you've got to do some of the things in the Burn Healy report, and then you don't need to do any tax increases at all. And I, I find this very interesting that um, um, Sweeney says we can't do a millionaire's tax because we're going to drive those people out of state. So Sweeney comes back with a new 3% surcharge on the corporate business tax, and Murphy says we can't do that. We're going to drive corporations out of state. I, listen, um, to me, you know, one, one area where Phil Murphy, I think, is short-sighted is if he believes that national policy is flawed on an income tax basis, you can't fix it at the state level. You cannot fix flawed national policy at the state level. You will make your state an outlier. Yeah. And can millionaires afford to pay more? Of course they can. But does that make it right? 1% of our filers in New Jersey pay 40% of the tax. We have the most progressive tax rates in the nation. You do tax returns. If you've got a couple that comes in that are both dual earners and they're making under 100000 are they paying a lot of income tax? Income tax. Yeah. They're really not. They're really not. Our tax rates are extremely progressive. So to me, the right thing to do right now is to get our, our spending under control. It's not a time for tax increases in New Jersey. It is time for an overhaul of our tax code. There's things that we need to do the tax code to make Jersey more attractive. Let's incentivize investment and work. There's things that we could do to change the perception in Jersey overnight. One thing I think we should be doing, quite frankly, is phasing out the corporate business tax 1% a year over a 10-year period. Believe it or not, it's a dwindling revenue stream anyway because fewer and fewer businesses are C corporations in the state for a lot of reasons. Phase it out. The optics of it would be unbelievable. 
Unbelievable. Make the capital gains on IPOs tax-free. Make the gain on the sale of a small business, which the IRS defines as 51% or more owned by five or fewer people, tax-free. All those mom and pop shops on Main Street, what have we really done for them? Those are the kind of things that could change the perception of New Jersey overnight and not have a major hit upon our budget. So I, I think that the two things are easy. When you talk about the millionaire's tax or the, the income tax, why are we all in the room? Why are we all living here in New Jersey? For the answer to most of us is because we can't leave. We're stuck here. So if you want to tax the people who can leave, like David Tepper, they're going to leave, and that's fine. So, I mean, we're here not because, I mean, we choose to be here, but at the same time, we can't leave. So the idea, it's real easy to say, oh, tax the rich, it's, it's all part of the rich. They're just going to leave, and they are leaving in full force. As far as what we should do, there's two easy answers to this. Again, this would be the non-Trenton view. So my house, I really need a new fence. I mean, it's 15 years old. It literally has fallen down in one panel. The guy behind me is really annoyed by it, but it's behind my shed, so I pretend like I don't see it. I really need a new fence, but I'm not buying it because I don't have the money for it. Just like my three teen teenagers are sharing one old car because I don't have the money to buy another one. So let's not buy things and pay for things that we don't have. As far as what we should do, why don't we go look and see what Tennessee's doing? Why don't we go look and see what North Carolina's doing? And see, because it's working there. I mean, you know, when I talk to government officials and they talk about the plan and this and that, and we're going to do that, I say, just tell me who you're modeling after. Which state is this plan modeled after that all of these, these companies have said, you know what, this was a great idea. I paid a lot more, but I got a lot more. I'm not sure where that ever happened. So if someone can show me where that happened, let's copy that plan instead. I mean, North Carolina was in the dumps 10 years ago, 15 years ago, right? They were dependent on tobacco was their whole economy. Let's go look at North Carolina right now, which is where I'm trying to send my kids. Go live there. If we want to find out what to do, let's go to the states that are doing it right. Nobody around the country is saying, man, we need to do stuff more like New Jersey. That's right. I mean, that's a, that's a nobody. That's a good point, Tom. And, and this whole notion that, well, we're getting so much more for our tax dollars. Are we really or do we just have a higher cost structure? So I calculated that our cost of policing in the state is 2.4 times the national average. How can that be? The answer is that we pay them 55 percent more um, and we have 55 percent more cops per capita than the average state. We let them retire at full pension at 55. That's right. So our, the cost structure is huge. It's not necessarily more services unless you regard speed traps as a valuable service. Um, and, um, you know, in schools, we all want good schools and, and none of us want our public school system to go the way of the California public school system. They put the brakes on too hard and it caused problems. At the same time, you compare us to Massachusetts. Absolutely. If we spent per pupil, what they spend in Massachusetts, we would spend $3.8 billion a year less on public yep. education. So we should at least be looking at those things and asking why, and are there things that we can do without sacrificing quality? And this is the frustrating thing about the current budget, Ralph, where these kinds of points, this budget status quo. And by the way, I don't want to seem partisan here. In many respects, the Christie budgets were also status quo on these very issues. Solving these issues is the long-term solution to New Jersey. And there's no political thanks for it, so it's hard to do. Well, unless, again, you're, unless you're willing to be a one-term governor. That's right. And again, I think, Senator Orr, you've talked about courage, that leaders have to have courage to do the right thing. Right. How do we force them to have courage? You know, I, I, Vote I, in primaries. Yeah, and, and, and at the same time, you know, uh, reward you know, the truth, because if somebody's out there trying to explain... Um, which actually the, the whole tax restructuring with the Transportation Trust Fund arguably was the largest tax cut in the history of New Jersey mm -hmm. uh, when you consider the debt was all on New Jersey residents. Day one, day one, we saved $10 billion of debt service, right? Explain it. It took 40 minutes to explain. It took 10 seconds to say no gas tax, right? Yep. That's, that's the problem. So, you know, we get in this thing of 10-second sound bites and whatnot, and if somebody, and so always ask us, where's your evidence? Where, where's, where's your information? Where's your data? I, I tell you, you know, uh, Tom has many of the same, you were talking about Massachusetts. I asked one time, one of the um, super, uh, commissioners educated came up. I said, Massachusetts, we score, you know, a little bit about, about the same, yeah. but they spend about a third less. That's f that was $4 billion that if we, well, you know, these are the things we have to tackle. But ask them, where's your information? Where's your, where, where, is, where is your data? 
as Jack said, he and I were the only CPAs in, in the legislature. Data is not something that people talk about very much down in, uh, you know, down in Trenton. But I, I, I will tell you, we were an economic powerhouse not too long ago. And as I said last year, there's, there's an economic theory called the price elasticity of demand. It means you raise your prices too high, customers start walking in the door. That's what they do, right? And that happened in New Jersey. And I think the key time, that inflection point was 2004, and we're still trying to get back to where it was. And if you take a look at all the different tax restrictions we've done over the, uh, since 2010, the aggregation of income and losses for the uh, pass-through entities, the NOLs for pass-through entities. We did the single sales factor. We did, and, and we, we got rid of the estate tax. We got rid of, you know, the, the retirement income exclusion. All these things, the opponents said all the time, you're going to create a hole in the budget. Not one year has resources after those cuts gone down. They've always gone up. And this year, the income tax, the gross income tax, and I think it has to do, obviously, Wall Street, because we are progressive. Wall Street doing well. Uh, you know, last year, Wall Street did you know, particularly well. Um, our, in our gross income tax is up. Another reason why it's up, and you would know, you know anecdotally better, better than, than all of us, but it's also that, I think, because of the estate tax going away, people are starting to say, hey, maybe I don't have to go. And then when I started talking about the millionaire's tax, they said, oh, here we go again. Now let me just start thinking about packing again. But not one year after all those tax reforms and cuts did resources go down. They went up. Yep. And I think that's, and that's what North Carolina did. They cut their rates and their resources went up. You know, I would have to say that I, I think part of the issue here is that there is a, a philosophical divide within the Democratic Party. Maybe I can illustrate it best by... I don't know if it was two years ago or whatever, but Governor Christie is delivering his budget uh, address and then, um, then comes on the Democratic response. So Speaker at the time, Vinnie Prieto, gets up and he begins by saying, you know, what we have in this state is a revenue problem. And he goes on and on and talks about why. And five minutes later, the, his deputy, Lou Greenwald, gets up and his first sentence is, what we have in New Jersey is a spending problem. So you would have thought that these were people from two different political parties talking. Mm -hmm. And so I, I remember um, being on a panel uh, up in Newark and Mayor Bracca was on the previous panel. And he said, what we need in our cities in New Jersey is a Marshall Plan for the cities. And so my point is, yes, our cities certainly have huge needs, but there is an enormous uh, philosophical divide, uh, not just within the state, but within the Democratic Party itself on how to address these things. I would say you have the same thing, because I think Senator Sweeney would say the same thing. We have a spending problem. Right. I think uh, Governor Murphy would say That's absolutely we need to right. grow the economy and we need a revenue you know, issue. That's absolutely right. And politicians, you know, as long as I can remember, you know, on the campaign trail, when they're asked, well, how are you going to pay for all this? The answer is always we're going to grow the economy, yeah. right? Ralph, specific to your question about, you know, how, how do we, how do we, I forget the exact word, but how do we make it better? Um, I'm an optimist by nature, and I don't want to be the skunk on the lawn party, nor do I want to seem immodest by suggesting that you're looking at two legislators who actually would get intimate with the details of the policy and its financial impact in every respect. You're never going to get 51% of the legislature to be that way. It's not the nature of politics. It's not the nature of the people that run for these part-time positions. We need our governor, our leadership at the top, which is a full-time job that has a full-time staff of dozens of experts to have these kind of discussions we're having right now. Lock yourself in a room for eight hours on one day and said, here's what we're going to do with respect to this issue. Here's what we're going to suggest with respect to that issue. It's got to be at the top. And you've got to turn up the heat a degree an hour. And you've <laughs> got to be willing to sacrifice the next election. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the situation in Jersey. Tom, I've got a question for you, and it comes up a lot about the, the pension and, and, uh, and whether it has been stress tested. Are the actuarial assumptions there, and I, I, I know who this question is coming from, a good friend of mine, but it comes up all the time about, and here is this question, if you stress tested the pension liabilities using ERISA type assumptions, how much greater would the liability be? Oh. Well, I cited already that the liability is somewhere between 50 and 150 uh, uh, billion dollars. And you know, if you want to go out to, um, uh, I think 
you know, that's probably two standard deviations. I've asked those questions of the actuaries, and I've made sure that we've stress tested out to three standard deviations. You know, if you want to do five, um, then we got a, a more serious problem than I've outlined. Um, so the numbers are within that. The, um, the two biggest risks are how much the state is going to contribute in. You know, are we going to get to a stage where we have enough revenue growth or enough tax increases, if that's your preference, um, to really come up with 6.6 .6 billion. I know how I would bet. I think we will not. So that's a risk. Um, and the investment returns. Um, you know, the, the assumed rate um, is, um, uh, they've changed it a few times. I think it's what, 765 now uh, what we're supposed to make? Or, quarter, or, I thought, seven, seven quarter? I think they raised it back up higher. Um, they just, the they new just, treasurer raised it back ra higher. Raised yeah. it back higher, yeah. So. Um, but most experts who've been wrong before uh, do not think we're going to have the same kind of returns in the next five years that we've had the past five years. Um, you all read stock market stuff, you know, take your pick, five, six percent. And we can't put all of our money in stocks. We have to diversify. And an, an analogy I've used when I talk to the union representatives on the board is, look, if you're going to take a train um, to Washington, you want to get there as fast as you can. So you want to take the fastest train, but you don't want the train to go so fast that it goes off the rails. Right. And um, so that is the balancing act. And we deal with all kinds of, of top consultants to come up with an appropriate asset allocation mix. And um, they all think we have. Um, so, but at, at some level, you know, you can do all the stress testing you want. The answer is who knows if you have um, the kind of crash that we had in, in 2002. Um, and, you know, we're careful that we're not too far out over our skis on tech stocks or anything else. Um, but it's really hard to control for the worst case outcomes. We've stress tested it. We've, we've got certain uh, hedged positions in place. Um, the big controversy in the state pension is, is our use of hedge funds, which um, we, we've cut in half over the last few years, and I thought we should. And, and, but nobody, even the labor guys, are saying we should uh, eliminate hedge funds. Some of those funds in 2008 were up 40% um, for us when nothing else was working. And so, um, you know, there's a little bit of an, an insurance premium in, in those sorts of investments. But again, um, we're trying to do things to make sure that, you know, no drawdown is so big that it really undermines the, uh, the whole system. Now, the one other thing I would say is that, um, and, you know, maybe there's two in the weeds, but we, we rely heavily on, on outside consultants. Um, we're, we don't have all the in-house software and, and um, you know, computer firepower that I wish we had. That's a budgetary issue, too. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's switch the conversation back to, uh, back to the budget and the fact that there hasn't been a lot of conversation about reducing costs. And here in New Jersey, we, we have an unusual situation where we have county government, we have municipal government, and, and you name it. There has been, I believe, only two consolidations of municipalities in the last 60 years. Right. Princeton, Princeton, John, Princeton Junction, Princeton Borough, and there was one up north. Well, yeah. Shout out. There's been a lot of call, uh, conversation about why can't we do shared services and consolidate, do mm -hmm. more consolidations. I'd like to throw that out to you guys for, to get your view of why can't that happen in today's environment? Well, I, I think there's a couple of things. One, it, uh, you got the municipalities, then you got the schools. And I actually think you can look at them separately. And I think there's an easy way, in my opinion, an easy way to go for, uh, from the school side. Um, I would say, you know, look at, you know, quite frankly, that you go K to 12, you know, districts, and quite frankly, you cut half the districts in, in, you know, in, in the state. Um, with respect to the municipalities, um, I, do, I do support very much the idea of the shared service. And the issue, because sometimes smaller is easy to, tr to track. But I, um, I think one of the main issues we have is public safety costs within even the smaller municipalities. And the 2% cap is meant to help to force that. And I've heard Senator Sweeney say many times, I wish I had gone for a 0% mm. instead, of, instead of a 2%. Mm. And, and it has helped because, I mean, you know, the town I live in, I was on the Franklin Council. Uh, we have a lot of shared services within, you know, with Hardiston and Hamburg and, and, and Ogdensburg. Um, 
but that the issue of forcing that that you know that shared services within the municipalities because sometimes you know let's face it smaller budgets are sometimes a lot easier for people to follow than necessarily if if um, you know bigger municipalities were, were necessarily better um, obviously our bigger cities wouldn't be in a situation you know that uh, that they're in so sometimes you know government that people are easy to understand and see where the dollars are going I, I think is a good thing I, the more that we can help uh, require shared services, the, the better, there's much uh, as we can do. But I also do think very quickly we can go from over 600 school districts to, you know, uh, you know, a little over 300, by going K to 12 right away. I personally think school choice is the right way to go and help drive down some costs and I think it'd be much better for our teaching professionals uh, as well. But those are the things I think that we can, uh, that we can certainly do and, um, you know, that would be my opinion. Now. That conversation has been had a number of times, but then you get the citizens of New Jersey saying, okay, that's good, but not for my school district. Yeah. How, do we, how do we get people to, to, so, to really get on board with that? Rules. So why don't, why don't we let people vote? So I live in Morris Plains. It's about three miles across, about 5,000 uh, residents. We have our own K through eight school system, which has two principals and a superintendent and a director of technology and, and all of that. So uh, my kids grow up in the eighth grade class. I have an eighth grader. There's about 60 kids. My kids are going to go to Morristown next year. We love Morristown. All the residents of Morris Township in Morristown go to Freeling Highs, and there's about 400 eighth graders. So we have the small school. They have the big school. We combine. OK, we pay a lot of taxes. They pay a lot of taxes. Could we combine into the Morris uh, Township school district from K through 12? Sure, we could do that. In theory, would that lower our rates? Maybe. So why don't we just put that up for a vote and say, OK, if you want to live in Morris Plains and you like to be in the little Morris Plains bubble and you want to make sure that there's only 60 kids per class, you're going to pay more money. Some people might want that. Some people might move to an area for that. They might say, that's what I want. So why don't we just let the people decide? Well, instead of debating, you're going to, we're not going to, we have our own police chief. We have our own fire chief, right? So let's let the residents decide do they want to do that? There's a lot of pros and cons. We can debate that, and, and I'll give you examples for both. And I went to high school in, in Northern Virginia where it was just Fairfax County where there's 35 huge schools and one superintendent. Pros and cons of that. Instead of letting people who have to decide on union votes or job votes determine whether this is right, just let the, let the people vote and say, hey, if you want to live in Morris Plains and have your own school system, you're going to pay an extra $5,000 a year. If you don't and you want to save money, you're going to be in a larger shared services community. And then people decide by their pocketbook and where they live when they move in. Why do people move in? They move in for schools. OK, I'm going to move into Morris Plains like their schools. I'm going to pay an extra five grand. Some people say yes. Some people say no. Some people will buy the house on the busy corner. Some people say, well, I'll never buy there. I'll pay more to live somewhere else. So when we have all these shared services discussions, why don't we just decide? Right? We can start with the school districts, make it all K through 12. If you want to live in your small one, you're going to pay more. I'd like to pick what I pay for. And I'll pick by where I, where I live and where I move and who I elect. So on the municipal uh, side of the equation, the late Ernie Riach, uh, professor at Rutgers, one of the state's great experts on, on property taxes, uh, estimated um, that if you uh, consolidated municipalities, you'd get savings of maybe 3 or 4%. And so the point is, uh, in his view, it wasn't a panacea. I think you have to focus on what I've called the level of services and the cost per unit of service. And I've alluded to some of that in my earlier comments. So what does this mean? Um, the Fund for New Jersey, of which I'm a trustee, sponsored a study some years ago. We put up a website that we actually paid Mark Magyars, now on Sweeney's staff, to do. And we put municipal budgets online and in simplified form so you could see them and could compare towns side by side. First thing is municipal budgets are, you, you have to be a CPA to have a shot at understanding them, right? <laughs> um, and um, Princeton, just, just one example you can extrapolate from, Princeton and West Windsor are right near each other, almost the same population. Princeton's municipal budget is three times uh, East Windsor's uh, municipal budget. Um, you know, a, a variance of 10, 15%, you go, okay, 
um, but three times, uh, that says to me that we need to look more closely at these line items and where are they spinning out of control, and I could tell you in Princeton where they are, and at some point it may mean that we need some kind of legislative action uh, that is analogous to, say, the DRG system in healthcare, the diagnostic related groups where um, costs have to be within you know, some uh, framework or you have to justify them. And the state may have to impose um, more discipline on municipal spending through some sort of uh, regimen like that at some time. The variances are huge, whether it's legal fees or land use planning, whatever category you want to talk about. Uh, when, when you have variances that wide, it just screams at you that there's room to save money. Ralph, I tried to commit political suicide when I was a Somerset County freeholder. Paul Stahl will remember this well. Uh, one of the reasons why I became a county freeholder is because I believe in regionalizing services because there's great emotional reaction to consolidating towns. Princeton's were able to pull it off because they were both named Princeton. Believe it or not, that goes a long way. It took us 100 years. It took you 100 years, <laughs> but they were both Princeton Borough, Princeton yeah. Township. Now it's just Princeton. Um, I tried to consolidate 19 little police departments into a countywide force um, with a North Central and South Precinct. It was a three-year study. I got the approval of the 19 mayors that had the 19 police departments to do this study. The vote was 19 to nothing. We took two years to do a one-of-a-kind study, brought in experts from around the country, buy-in from all the various stakeholders in the community. Two years later, we had a study that showed an improved quality of product, and a $94 million property tax savings over 10 years. And we had the vote amongst the same 19 mayors, the vast majority of which were still Republican. The vote went 17 to two against. Your local office holders right now are the greatest obstacle to the consolidation of services and or the consolidation of towns. Everyone's fearful the next campaign, there's gonna be a flyer out that Steve compromised security in our community by combining our police department with X. That, that's what I'm saying about Steve. And, and so the greatest obstacle, and the state doesn't do a good enough job to provide cover and incentive to make it all happen. Exactly. And that 3 to 4% savings, you know, I know we all feel we, as overtaxed as we are in New Jersey, we should achieve every penny of savings we can. But that 3 to 4% doesn't count the legacy costs. So when Princeton combined, on day one, there were like two dozen fewer people on the payroll. That's two dozen fewer defined benefit pension costs, two dozen fewer lifetime medical benefits. The legacy costs have a big impact. Mm -hmm. Good point. Ralph, I, something that Tom had said is very true. The issue of the vote, when they take away the vote on the school board, at a time when we had, they said, well, we put in a 2% cap, so therefore, you know, move it and move it to the general, if they move to the general election, they stay within the 2% you know, cap, you know, they don't have to have this, you know, the budget approved anymore. Uh, at a time when most of our enrollment was going down. So I, <clears throat> I voted against it because, I, you know, I don't want to take the vote away from the people because sometimes when I was on a local council, when the people voted something down, that made my job so easy. Because, when they, you know, the school board one time came and said, Steve, they came with their books and they had to come with their books and I had gone through and I had like six pages of questions. And they said, Steve, you don't have to do it. We're by law. We're allowed to just, you can say yes, we can pass. I said, no, the people voted no. Go, oh, yeah, but they, it was only, it was a close vote. I said, no. <laughs> they voted no. So then I said to them, I said, we can go over my six pages of questions, or you can go outside and tell me what's a reasonable number that, because we all know you got fluff in that budget. A reasonable number that can cut the budget. We're going to go line item by line item. And they said, no, no, Steve, you don't have to. Finally, one of their, their, their school board presidents says, Hey, serious. Why don't, why don't we just go out and talk about this? They came in, they cut their budget by a certain, you know, a, a, a reasonable amount, and boom, it was, you know, it, it was done. But the easiest thing was, people said no. Interesting. Let's switch to another topic that's kind of uh, hit the table. Yesterday, um, unbeknownst to many of our members here, the governor was here at the Bogata to lay down his sports bet. He first did it at, uh, at, uh, in, in, in his hometown area at the racetrack. And uh, interestingly, he said, I, I, I put down a sympathy bet on the Mets. So what do you think is going to be the impact of sports betting here in, in New Jersey? Is that, and where would the f revenue from that, where would that be directed? Uh, it's not going to be a panacea, in my opinion. It, it was the right decision by the Supreme Court because the old environment was terribly unfair to the other 46 states. 
since four had it and 46 didn't. Um, I voted no on the bill, to be transparent with you, because I have a real problem with sports betting on collegiate sports. Um, I don't think we should be placing wagers on competitions that are taking place between people 18 and 19 years old. Um, now, you can't place a bet on a collegiate game that takes place in New Jersey yeah. or a collegiate game in which a New Jersey college participates no matter where it is in the country. But if Villanova is playing St. John's at a square garden, you could bet on that one. Uh, I had a problem with that aspect of the bill, but it, it's the right decision by the Supreme Court. Otherwise, I don't think it's a panacea. But whatever does come in because it's new revenue, to me, should be earmarked for one of our three crises. Mm -hmm. The school funding crisis, we have a lot of underfunded districts, while districts like Oboken are overfunded. We've got a property tax crisis, we've got a pension crisis. To me, all new revenue streams should be specifically dedicated to one of the three crises, because if we don't, you're getting taxed more. We also have an infrastructure crisis that's worth talking about at some point. Okay. That's over $100 billion in needs, too. Okay. Any uh, other thoughts on Listen, I think sports betting is going to bring in a good bit of money, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to find its own level. It's going to be good here, much like cannabis would if you wanted to recreational cannabis. I think these are stopgap measures that people hang their hat on and say, we can't find anything else, so here is our panacea for all of that. I think it'll bring a little bit more money. I think it would be nice if it was in a lockbox, to use an old phrase. For something, I think it'll eventually all that money will just get blended into some of these programs and we won't see the true benefit from it. Um, you're right, this was the way it's going. Um, cannabis is coming too. There's, there's no reason not to think it is, although there's a whole bunch of issues with that that the governor didn't realize. But I don't think ultimately this solves our problem. These are quick fix band aid revenue jumps that aren't going to solve our spending problem and our out of control um, issues that we have with, with so many of the, the state things that we have already. I think well, it's going to be a little bit of money, but I bet it's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Cannabis has come up. We had a lot of discussion about that uh, uh, at our conference here, uh, some of the things that uh, we, we started to do. We've actually put together an interest group on cannabis because recognizing that the, the challenges of that industry and, and whatnot. Let me get your perspective and your thoughts on the legalization of recreational marijuana. For the, one of the most uh, asked questions I get right now, because I'm, I'm, I'm opposed to legalization of marijuana. Decriminalization is, is, is the one thing. Medical marijuana is obviously completely different. It's trying to be successful. Uh, but one of the most important questions I get is, hey, Steve, uh, other, the person on the other side of the phone, Steve, I'm against legalization of marijuana, but if it comes, can I get, can I get the regulations and how it works? Because I think we're going to make a lot of money on this. So can you tell me how I can get involved? And we know that uh, I've had that question asked many, many, many different times. Um, I think it's going to be difficult for the government to get it passed. I, uh, in, the, um, in the majority party, in the Democrat party, I understand that there's a number of very solid no votes um, uh, on it. So I think it's, it's, it's not going to be as, as easy. I know that right now they're trying to put a bill together that deals with both medical and uh, legalization of, of marijuana. Um, I think that's going to have a hard time getting passed, but it's uh, something that was actually, I think, uh, scored a little bit in, in, in the budget or proposal that was, that was given, if, if there was anything in there. Um, but obviously, I don't think that's going to be part of this, this year's budget. I think the discussions are still going to continue on. And there is apparently negotiations going on in that aspect. So, so here's what we hear about cannabis on the business end. And this is, this is a double-edged sword. Um, first of all, if, if everybody can bet on sports and everybody can bet on cannabis, in theory, we're sitting there saying there's all these people that have all this extra discretionary cash that they're just dying to spend, right? I'm going to drop 100 bucks on gambling and 50 bucks on pot every week. I don't know who these people are who have all this money. So that's what we're counting on for these increased revenues at one point. Before or after the bet. Well, <laughs> you know, so that's why we think the revenue is limited. There's a whole lot of issues with legalizing uh, recreational use of cannabis, especially in the urban cities, which the governor did not count on. And we can discuss that ad nauseum. And we had three panels on it. So trust me, I know all of the details. But from a business standpoint, you have this. Where the real money in cannabis is, isn't getting the $10 off of 100 from a street sale. The real money in the state of New Jersey is Pharma 2.0 with all our pharma companies. That's huge, huge money. It's uh, logistics and infrastructure. 
talk to real estate people and they talk about, when you talk about all of these, we have all these warehouses in the state that one, industrial can't fill up fast enough, but how many outdated facilities do I have that people are saying, okay, can these be indoor grow farms? The real estate people are as excited about oh, yeah. cannabis as much as anybody else because I, you, you need to grow, you need to grow because cannabis is gonna have to be grown indoors. If people don't realize that, this is not in the backyard of people. All of this stuff is gonna need to have a controlled indoor environment and we've got a lot of places that are outdated that companies don't wanna work in anymore that could be transferred into aero farm type stuff for pot. So the real estate people are really excited about that. The trucking and logistics people are really excited about that. You talk about how many, how many more trucks have been on the road, how many more e-commerce is on the road through Amazon. And this is a whole other issue on the lack of truck drivers that's gonna come up real fast in this, in this state and in this country. So there's a chance to make a whole bunch of money on these pharmaceutical companies developing Pharma 2.0 drugs and medications for medicinal use. That's where the big money is in cannabis. However, the cannabis people tell me the national organizations that have these type of things who want to come in New Jersey because of our pharma background, because of our location, because of our transportation, will not come here if recreation is not approved because they don't want to have any hiccups in the law on what they can and can't do. It's just not worth it to them. So we have to legalize the recreational to gain all the benefits of the medical from a big business perspective. And for a lot of reasons, recreational is probably not going to be approved and certainly not overwhelming as quickly as you thought it was. So that's, that's, that's a missing out opportunity. And you wonder if New York or Delaware or someone else is going to pick up on where well, we can do this Farmer 2.0, Massachusetts with all of the companies they have, North Carolina, which I'm not sure why I'm not living there. Um, you know, when they pick up on all of these things and say, hey, here's good revenue opportunity. So it's a real odd twist of fate in a lot of the issues that are gonna prevent recreational from being passed are gonna prevent the growth on the medicinal side. And the medicinal growth is where the real money is. It's not the black market taxation. Tom makes an excellent, uh, compelling argument, but I'm still opposed. Um, I, I worry greatly when revenue generation is the primary catalyst for a major policy change. I think we should still take at least a five-year wait period to see how things go in other states that have already legalized marijuana. Uh, Phil Murphy's primary motivation for the legalization of marijuana, he'll never say it publicly is for the revenue. He'll say it's to address the social injustices that are in the community because people of color are incarcerated at a rate of 10 to 1 versus people of non-color uh, with regard to small possessions of drugs. We can address that with the decriminalization. Uh, of marijuana. So, um, for, and I do believe this, we still have an opioid epidemic yeah. in the community. And the legalization of marijuana, in light of how we're trying to wind down and wind away from that opioid epidemic, is ill-timed. So for those reasons, I remain opposed. But from the very beginning, I've been for the decriminalization of marijuana. I'd hate to see a 16, 17, 18, 19-year-old with a criminal record because of it, caught with, an, with a possession that is not intent to distribute but for recreational use purposes. Yeah. Well, let me switch to another topic. Early on in the campaign, um, Governor Murphy talked about a state bank. We haven't heard anything recently about that. Is, uh, Senator, any, any, any discussions? Some people have said that that's tied to the legalization of marijuana. Okay. Marijuana, because they need to do something with the cash. Um, and it's obviously still federally um, illegal. Um, was, is, I, I don't think I've read the, the legislation that was put forth on, on, the, on the state bank. Um, the question I had, we have a Department of Banking Insurance, and you look at the legislation part, I don't think our Department of Banking Insurance would approve a charter for that, for that state bank. Uh, I don't think it's, I, don't, I, I think our, our banks um, here in New Jersey, community banks and our bigger banks do, do a, you know, a terrific job. I think uh, leave that alone, let the private sector take care of that. I don't think it's state bank. Let's face it, it was one state that has it, right? It was North Dakota. North, state, Dakota. North, Dakota. North Dakota. And quite frankly, uh, if it was something that was a panacea, uh, you would have had, you know, uh, everybody else, you know, trying to do it. But when you read the legislation part, you think, how the heck does this not become another albatross for the taxpayer? The, the North Dakota Public Bank annual report actually says... Um, this model isn't necessarily applicable to other states. Basically, you know, you don't yeah. need to try this here. It's for farmers. It's, it's not a general thing. My view 
is that it's going to quietly just go away. I, I think it made the governor look innovative uh, on the campaign trail. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen. And um, interestingly enough, uh, the same um, labor unions that supported the governor uh, early on, uh, have, some of them have called me in and said, hey, assure us that uh, none of our pension money is going to be invested in a private bank. We don't want it there. Um, you know, we, we want to get market rate returns um, on our money. We don't want to be subsidizing other people. And I've said, look, as long as it's on my watch, it's not going to happen. My watch is ending pretty soon. So um, the irony there is that some of his core constituents um, are very nervous about a, a public bank. So uh, a lot of time in my job, I'll go around, I'll talk to various business and political leaders in all walks of life, and we'll talk about whatever is important to them, lawyers' law, bankers' bank, accountants' accounting. Uh, but I always ask a couple of general questions. What do you think about this th th and that and this? I haven't, I've yet to come up with anyone in the state who has thought the state bank was a good idea. Okay. I met one. <laughs> Well, I, agree with Murphy. <laughs> I agree with everything that's been said. And, um, and I, I do think if we're trying to make uh, change that can really be a catalyst for our state economy, let's have a discussion instead of a state bank about maybe us adopting um, um, Delaware's laws and mm -hmm. regulations with, with regard to business formation. Um, as we all know, a great many people open up businesses in Delaware for a lot of reasons. Why not do that here in New Jersey? Have we really talked about, thought about adopting their laws with regard, with regard to business formation and business regulation? Um, Michael Cohen set up the corporation that paid Stormy Daniels in Delaware. <laughs> um, but um, I think that's the kind of conversation we want to be having. And by the way, if we can get more businesses to open up shop here, to, to form as a business here, what that also means is if there's a bankruptcy proceeding, that takes place here. That would be good for our legal community. If there's litigation with respect to that corporation, more than likely it would take place here. So it has all other kinds of trickle effects. Those are the kind of conversations we should be having, uh, in my opinion, to, to really think about how best to jumpstart our economy over the long term. And okay. stop penalizing venture investing. Yes. Let's Absolutely. create incentives Absolutely. to it instead of the disincentives we currently have. It's I mean, crazy. As I said, you know, the issue of, of capital, those states that are attractive to capital do well. Yeah. Like on that, capital on that, gains on IPOs, yep, tax capital gain, exactly. on, right, on that or, very or topic, you, we have 360,000 small businesses here in New Jersey. Yep. Certainly, they didn't benefit very much from what was done on December 22nd with the signing of the Tax Reform Act there. And we haven't really done anything here in the state to incentivize those 360,000 small businesses to, one, stay here right. and also to invest here. What, what can we do in that regard? I know our members have been sensitive to that because they represent a lot of small businesses here. And I'm sure they're hearing where those small businesses are saying, is it time for me to leave New Jersey? You know, Ralph, that's interesting because um, not too long ago, we were back in 2010, 2011, I uh, remember with the pastruentes and LLCs, LLPs, and S corps. Obviously, LLPs and um, LLCs are the fastest growing um, uh, capital structures around. New Jersey said, "Hey, if you have one pastruentity and another pastruentity, one one's a profit, one's a loss." They said, "Well, we only want to hear about the one who's making a profit. The loss, you get no benefit from." Right. And we actually had to work bipartisan on uh, Senator Barbara Bono and I. Uh, to do the aggregation of income and losses, right? Exactly. Uh, and then the NOLs, you know, allowing them to have NOLs. That took so long to, to get done. And it's been, and it's been, it was good for our business community. We could go so much further because we limit how much you can actually use the, uh, you know, the, the, the aggregation. Right. Um, the capital gains, you know, tax on these small businesses, uh, give a preferential rate. As I said, many, many times the opponents will say, you're going to create a hole in the budget. We didn't create a hole in the budget. The resources went up when you gave businesses the ability to say, okay, if I invest, if I take a risk on something, I invest, you know, some are going to pan out, some aren't going to pan out. But if you're attractive and you reward, you know, uh, capital and capital formation, uh, we, we, do, we would do significantly better. And look at all our small, uh, most of our economy is based upon our, you know, our small businesses. 
Um, so anyway, we have a lot more that I think we could do. Raise, you know, get rid of the limitation on the aggregation that we put on back then that we could actually get. I think it was, what, 50%? Uh, we could get rid of that. We could absolutely get rid of that and then bring in a capital rate. So I'm uh, friends with the former CFO of one of the biggest VC firms in the country. And I emailed him on this topic. And I'll, I'll just, I think you all know this, but I'll just read it from his email. New Jersey does not allow you to offset a $500,000 gain from partnership A with a $500,000 loss from partnership B, even if in the same year. I mean, this is crazy stuff. So um, you, you have a, a net position is zero and you're paying tax on $500,000. Who wants to invest in a situation like that? Um, so th those we should follow the federal way. I mean, quite yeah, frankly, exactly. right to the federal. We should follow the federal. There's no reason for uh, not doing that. Yeah, the other issue, there was a, a piece in, um, I think it was yesterday's Wall Street Journal about um, the business incentive uh, program in New Jersey. And first of all, 55% uh, of the money went to um, just keeping jobs in New Jersey, um, not, not bringing new jobs in. And, you know, that gets to be a poker game. The CEO says, I'm going to leave. And, you know, you don't know if he's serious, but if you're the governor, you don't want him to leave on your watch. So exactly. we, we pay up. And, you know, I, I think you've all probably seen uh, enough that too much of that money is going to the largest corporations right. in the state, as I say, in poker games, and, and not enough is being allocated to small and mid-sized businesses. And we got to fix that, too, I think. Yeah, agreed. In addition to what they've said so far, which I'm in total agreement, Ralph, and uh, you've heard me say it earlier, and it was a major plank in my platform last year, I really believe this, particularly with how hard it is to do business in New Jersey, but small business is the backbone of our economy, and uh, I really believe this, the gain on the sale of a family-owned business yeah. should be tax-free in New Jersey. Pay your capital gains to the feds, but I believe it should be, the IRS definition is 51% or more owned by five or fewer people. The gain on the sale of a family-owned business in New Jersey should be tax-free. I, have to, I couldn't agree more with, with, with Jack on that because I tell you, one of the reasons why we had to go off the estate tax first as opposed to the inheritance tax, at least with the inheritance tax, you could transfer a business to a direct lineage. In the estate tax, you couldn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and it was affecting so many of our small exactly. businesses how to sell assets because they didn't have the liquidity, therefore affecting, affecting the family. Senator, you brought up the estate tax, and we all know that uh, as of January 1, 2018, out. it's out. The question, I think, that is on a lot of people's minds, is there a chance for it to come back in? There's been some conversation, um, not, not a lot out in the press, but there have been innuendos, let's say, that, uh, that the, there will be a repeal of the appeal of the state tax. Let me tell you what I've, I've been here. Well, first of all, as part of the whole transportation trust fund, there was a poison pill. And there's an easy way to get around it. I mean, they'd have to do something very specific. They have to pass a new law. The, um, uh, the, then the poison pill basically said, you, get, you bring back the estate tax, you bring back the retirement income, you know, you, you, that you don't have the ex level of exclusion anymore. The gas tax goes away, all right? Um, so, so the majority party would have to do something very specific. Now, what you'll hear from and Senator Sweeney and Senator Saul have basically said publicly, the estate tax isn't coming back because they really believe it is working. If you look at our gross income tax, it's growing. At you know, uh, in the month of May, this you know, this it just came out yesterday. It grew at thir over 13 percent. All right, I firmly believe some of that has to do with we're not losing as much as we were. It, not that we have to revert and get everybody, you know, c people coming back. We just have to do less worse, right? Um, so, you know, quite frankly, and I have heard uh, very recently as well that when the governor came out with his budget, did not have the estate tax coming back. Uh, I've heard recently from uh, people with inside administration, they also believe that it's actually working and we should not bring it back. So um, the sales tax is a different issue. Uh, but I do believe that they believe the estate tax is, is something that, that, that's working. Now, there are plenty of people within uh, the majority party that believe that uh, let's just you know, bring back the uh, exemption level, right. bring it something high. But I, don't, I firmly don't think we're going we're to see that because I, I do think enough, and we're not going to know for sure until we start seeing some of the IRS data where they track where people have moved from, from state to state. Generally, it takes about a two-year lag on something right. like that. But I do think that, you know, through our uh, anecdotal evidence of the gross income tax, I think people say we're not doing as bad at losing as we used to do. 
Recently, we've had a number of bills that have gone through the legislature um, this term that were presented last term that Governor Christie vetoed. Um, gender equity, uh, anti-arbitration, uh, mandatory paid sick leave, all on the surface sound like these would be great bills, but when you look at the underlying provisions in them, they don't, they're, they're not, not business, business friendly. What, now that these bills are moving through, and they're, obviously I, I believe a uh, number of them have already been signed off by the governor and those that will be, what, what kind of signal does that send to the business community with, given some of those underlying provisions? And I'll point out one thing in particular, um, Seattle, Washington, increased minimum wage to $11 several years ago. Result was the following year, unemployment went up. Individuals who were uh, entitled to get that increase said, I don't want that increase because it takes me over the, the, the threshold to get subsidies. Minimum wage is, is, is on the table here. And I, I, I know our members are concerned about it in terms of how it gets implemented. Can we get something done that would be fair to businesses and won't drive businesses out of here? Uh, I do believe there should be an increase in the minimum wage to about $10 an hour. I think it's the kind of thing that a legislature should revisit every three to five years, depending on what's going on in the economy, the ebb and flow of the economy. Um, that was campaign rhetoric, $15 minimum wage. That's the Bernie Sanders sounds good to the base. It lathers up the base. Um, I don't believe you're going to see it. I, that's the one thing I just don't see. You don't hear Murphy talking about it, and I don't think the legislature has an appetite for it. You're just not going to see it because of the disastrous impact it would have, particularly on small business in New Jersey. So I, I just don't see that, that coming. Having said that, all the other bills that you mentioned that were vetoed by Christie and now adopted, I think that's a majority giving their Democratic governor a few bones, because after all, he did win. And you've got to give them a few victories inside the door. I'm not saying I agree with every one of those bills. I don't. But that's just the nature of politics. He gets a few, you know, is it the 12 executive orders in the first two weeks. We get a handful of bills that show there's a change that's taking place in Chenton compared to the last eight years. But now with this budget and with things like the $15 minimum wage, the real, real heavy lifting, you're seeing this legislature really push back on the governor. Okay. I think some of the, the, the message, I think, is, is, is really um, critical because... I mean, in business, and this is where, you know, the CPAs is the most trusted uh, advisor could really, really, really help because, let's face it, businesses aren't looking at just sick pay. They're not looking at vacation. They've moved on to paid time off, you know, um, and, and having, and it's all part of compensation, you know, whether it be your pension, whether it be your, your health care, whether it be your, your salary, it's all part of compensation. Let, let the businesses, you know, take care of that. And as government gets more and more prescriptive of you got to do this, um, I, I, I think that's extremely detrimental to, to the, our business community. The other thing which I really hope the governor keeps uh, is a red tape review, you know, commission. Uh, it was bipartisan. And if the governor doesn't keep it, I've, I've asked uh, our legislative, like Senator Sweeney, uh, some in Berticelli who uh, uh, was on it with me to have it just from a legislative committee because it actually came became uh, where a number of businesses would come and let's face it the legislature you know a lot, a lot of times legislators like to think they know everything we don't you know so if when they, you, things would get brought to that red tape review committee that you'd sit there and say really we actually we actually do this here and you know on our bipartisan basis a lot of things would it would actually, you know, you know, get done. So I, I, I just hope uh, in some way, because that's the regulatory side. We've talked a lot about taxes here. Right. Right the regulatory side is so much of the, of the other stuff that, that sure. every business has to deal with. And it's such a, you know, it can be such a burden. Sure. Let me throw out one other subject because I know we're getting close to our time here. New Jersey is the largest exporter of high school seniors in the country. And one of the things that came out in the McKinsey report was the fact that if New Jersey wants to be competitive, it's got to have a great talent base. We spend roughly 20000 for K, uh, kindergarten through 12, K through 12 education. But when you look at post-secondary education, I think it's around five, $6,000. 
what do we need to do to get ourselves back in the game to keep talent in New Jersey? Because obviously, if companies are going to think about coming here, they want to have the talent. And there's been recent studies that say, have said there is a gap uh, in terms of the skills that the, the current workforce have here oh, yeah. that isn't attractive to businesses coming on. So let me get your thoughts on that of, of what needs to be done in that area. Oh, a, a couple of things. I, I believe this. People will live where they believe they can achieve their American dream. Now, we have pockets of success. There are sections of Jersey City that are booming with millennials. We have sections of Hoboken that are booming millennials. For too long, our cities have not been cool. I have four children. They want to be where it's cool. My sleepy suburb home is not cool. So my house is a lot more <laughs> quiet. But, cool yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but So you know, the next generation, they want to go where they can achieve their American dream and where it's cool. So we, we do need kind of a Marshall Plan, if you will, for our cities to make them cool. And we need a, a, a very, very dynamic, I think, strategic plan to ensure that businesses locate here. We've talked about a number of things today to make New Jersey more attractive. You know, here's the thing. We, we have been number one in out-migration in, in many respects, but yet the population figures just came out and we just went up a little bit. So we're still, we're, we're creeping toward nine million. So yes, there are people that are leaving that we wish came back home after going to college. And there are people of extreme wealth that earned a fortune here and then go to, listen, we're never gonna be able to regulate our climate. Right. But things that Steve, Steve Horjo has done has made this state more attractive for a retirement basis, strictly from a tax planning standpoint. And we, we do need to uh, make our economy more dynamic and our cities cool. Because right now, that's where the next age group of workers wants to be. Sure. Urban areas that are cool. Sure, and there's chicken and egg in that because right. you're cool if you have startups. Um, and you don't have startups unless you have a, a tax structure and other incentives that um, promote or are favorable to a startup atmosphere. So there's chicken and egg there. And, you know, 25, 28 year olds, the, the new businesses, um, you know, they're attracted in that direction uh, heavily. And um, so you have to do that. And then by the time they're 30 or 35, they go, well, I got to live somewhere. I can't afford the property taxes in this state. So, um, you know, we've compounded the problem there. And so on all these fronts, it's not one simple answer. On all these fronts, we have a lot of work to do. Um, but Cool is absolutely right. You know, I'm over for 4 too. I got two in California, one in New York, and one in Washington. And, you know, I want them to be where it, it's best for them. But I, I wish that they would find good opportunities here. They're finding better opportunities elsewhere. And you're right that you know, we pay more for K-12 to than any other state. We're doing the country a favor. And, you know, one of the things I've talked to um, some policymakers about is it's ironic that we pay, you know, 20-some thousand to educate a 12th grader, and we pay almost nothing to educate a 13th grader and there's a lot more we've been disinvesting in higher education in this state for a long time um, you know I, I'm a Princeton uh, alum um, our engineering school last time I looked was ranked 17th in the country um, and that's the best in the state um, we need to be investing much more heavily in um, in the, that kind of education. We have good schools, but we, we're, we don't have schools that compete with Palo Alto and, and Boston in those areas, and, and we need to amp it up. So all those things at some level go together. And on that point, I think our, our higher education system needs to be a, do a better job of working very symbiotically with industry to be a feeder program. Okay. You, like, you come to school here, we'll get you a job here, because people, they won't stay here. Right. So I have, oh, yeah. I have five kids. Um, Me too. <laughs> two, of, two of which are in college and one is a junior in high school and looking. So I'll say a couple of things on this perspective. Uh, and I tell them, it all comes down to money. So my daughter just completed her freshman year. My daughter is very bright, the type, of, the type of student that New Jersey wants to keep. I made her apply to Rutgers. She didn't want to. She applied. She got in. Um, in the end, it came down to Rutgers and Michigan were the two choices of where she was going. I think a lot of people, given the choice of the schools, might take Michigan over Rutgers. Then again, Rutgers is a home school. For us, the decision was really easy. Um, once the aid came in, Rutgers was more than double the cost of Michigan. It wasn't even close. Crazy. It wasn't even close. I said, you're going to Michigan whether you want to or not. Uh, Michigan <laughs> found a lot of money for my daughter. Rutgers didn't. I see that in the schools. I've now been in three um, meetings with guidance counselors on schools I recommend. And my daughter went in there, and here's 15 schools we recommend. There wasn't a single New Jersey school on there. So somewhere there's a disconnect between the guidance counselors pushing the New Jersey schools. 
I see that in the mail that I get every day. I have three kids between 17 and 20. Trust me, I get mail from colleges every day. I never get anything from Rutgers. I never get anything from Seton Hall. I never get anything from Stevens. Um, I don't know who or how they're recruiting, but they're not recruiting my kids, and I get stuff from, every, from colleges that I've never heard of. So there's a huge disconnect there. I think the colleges are getting better at working with the universities, but the colleges also need to do a better job of working amongst themselves. And I've heard this from a lot of higher ed people. We need to start establishing, hey, if you want to be an accountant, this is the best school for you in New Jersey. If you want to be a lawyer, you might want to go here. Medical sciences, go here. If you want to do uh, you know, um, something with horses, you want to go here. There's not enough. The New Jersey schools aren't feeding off each other to say, hey, we all can be a specialty. And I think New Jersey City University and St. Peter's have talked about it. We're right next to each other. We don't both need to try to be good in everything. You be good in five things, I'll be good in five things. If one of my students wants a minor in something that you're really good at, we'll go across town and minor there, as opposed to everybody trying to have it. But I don't see the New Jersey schools doing enough to try to recruit the kids that we want to stay. Some people say they want the out-of-town money. I don't know. I know that uh, at Morristown High School, the kids who were admitted into the honors program were a bunch of kids that wouldn't go to million, Rutgers in a million years. So that's the way Rutgers picks kids for their honors program. Oh, we look at your SAT scores and your, SA, and your GPA, and, and you've gotten in. And these kids are saying, well, I'm going to Princeton, or I'm going to Harvard, or I'm going to Johns Hopkins. I'm not going to Rutgers Honor School. So I, I, again, I've never, it's beyond me that you would have an honors college that they're proud of and the building's proud of. And instead of saying, hey, we've, you can come here for a full ride, and we want you to apply here, and we want to know that it's going both ways, Rutgers says, hey, you did really well in your SATs. Do you want to come? And people look at him saying, no, we don't. Um, so the, the higher education has done a better job at working with businesses um, but not a good, good enough job, in my opinion, working with, with kids because they're not working with my kids. And, and the point you made about the rankings, and the rankings I tell my kids, you know, they are what they are. Let's not get too much into it. But to be honest, New Jersey does have a, a ways to go. And I remember we did the story when the last US, U.S. News and World Report rankings come out, right? This is the Bible of there's 37 college rankings. So Princeton was number one again. And then I believe the number was you had 13 colleges or universities in Massachusetts before the next New Jersey school came up. Yeah, right. It goes back to discretionary spending, the squeeze on it, and how that's affecting higher education in the state. It all connects. Okay. Connect. We're coming to the words end. Let's go uh, with what I call a lightning round. Uh, and there was one question that came in that said, each of you are leaders in this state. Can you state one goal that you would like to see focused on in 2018, fiscal year 2018-2019? Tom, I'll start with you since you're closest. Um, the big ticket is uh, the pension system. Fix it, and it'll, fix, it'll let us solve a lot of the other problems. Jack? The one thing we can do immediately is reform the current school funding formula because that will provide equity across the state with our 580 school districts and address the property tax crisis in part immediately. I'll, 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 tell, I'll go with both of them, but I would say the, the, the health care and the pension issue is the number one issue. And if we don't deal with that and show credibility in that, I mean, you know, where, where would the faith be? So we have to deal with that issue. Tom, you're bad and clean up here. I agree so. with all of that. I'm going to go outside of the basic rule and go to this idea. New Jersey talks about how great it is and how great we are, but does a really lousy, terrible job of promoting that to people outside Very the true. borders. Can I, really can I terrible point. job. Good can I point. give my father's perspective on this question? Sure. My father, in his pithy way, would say, would summarize New Jersey's problems by saying, in New Jersey, if you're not getting something for nothing, you're not getting your fair share. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause for our panelists. No. Thank you all so very, very much for your, your uh, participation here today. I know there's a lot going on in the state that you could be elsewhere. We appreciate you being here with us in Atlantic City and at, at our uh, convention and expo and appreciate all of your comments and, and thoughts about where we need to go. Our challenge, I think, to our members, uh, as we stated before, and I, I, Alan Sobel may be here and I don't want to embarrass him, but, you know, get engaged. Um, Alan thought about something that he, he wrote an a open letter to the governor, and, and now it's being worked, uh, being worked on. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all again.
Uh, the next session is going to start in a few minutes, so please uh, move quickly to the, uh, the next sessions.